All right, I had a bunch of more jokes prepared for the top, but like I said, uh, we don't have that much time and uh, this is a little dense. Um, so I apologize in advance, I suppose. Um, so thank you, Andrea, for introducing me. Um, I think all of I, that was all the relevant information. Um, so we'll just get started then. Uh, so what I want to do with this presentation is I want you guys to learn how to create an executable narrative architecture as an independent creator. And so we'll be covering a few different things. We'll be defining transmedia storytelling and some important theory um, behind it. We'll go over what uh, we mean by indie transmedia and how we design for it. Um, what factors of production we need, we need to focus on as independent creators. Um, we'll talk about how we should vary our mediums and um, how in what way that affects our architecture. And then we'll talk about um, what all of this actually means. So a transmedia story is one that unfolds across multiple media platforms with uh, each new text making a distinctive and valuable contribution to the whole. Um, some examples include Star Wars, Halo, and Star Trek. Um, now, why do we tell transmedia stories? Um, there are a lot of reasons, but for the purposes of this presentation, the important idea is leveraged engagement. Transmedia stories are effective because they allow different audiences to enjoy the same story by, by appealing to different interests. Uh, Jeff uses this in his PhD thesis, and I like it as an example, so I'm going to use it here. Um, Star Wars has ships and blasters, lightsabers and Jedi, the Force and philosophy, and, and all sorts of things, right? Um, now, all of these um, are very different aspects, um, but they're all of the same world, right? Star Wars isn't Star Wars without the Force, um, but it's also not really Star Wars without those like ships and blasters. Um, and all of these elements attract completely different fans, right? Um, different audiences like different things, um, but you don't just have to leverage those story world elements um, in your transmedia story, right? Um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe does this really well with characters. Um, fans will follow the character of Captain America through all of his adventures, um, even ones where he's not the main star, right? Um, people like, people watched uh, Captain America Civil War, um, but they also might watch Avengers, Avengers Infinity War, even though Cap isn't the main character. Going back to the Star Wars example, the fact that these two images on screen right now can exist and arise from the same story world is a perfect example of why leveraged engagement works. On the left-hand side is a bisection of the Millennium Falcon uh, with a bunch of technical details about the ship's parts and how it operates. On the right is an image of the official website of the Jedi Church, um, which is an officially recognized re religion in the country of New Zealand. Um, so the illustration on the left demonstrates the attractiveness of Star Wars to aviation, space, and engineering fans. Uh, the Jedi Church um, picture on the right illustrates the connection that many fans have to the philosophical as aspects of the franchise. So the last two major theoretical concepts that we need to discuss um, are that of the narrative architecture and um, that of extensibility. So in essence, a transmedia story's narrative architecture is the roadmap for the transmedia story. Um, you know, which elements will be told in which mediums, um, when each story will be released, et cetera. Um, extensibility is also important. Um, can the characters, places, and things in your transmedia story exist across mediums and events? Um, continuity in uh, story is foundational to transmedia storytelling. So many elements of your story must be extensible in some way. Don't worry, we're done with the theory. Thank you guys for listening to me ramble about it. I love my theory, but there's other things to talk about now. Um, but so what, uh, how does any of this relate to independent transmedia storytelling? Uh, first, let's define what that term means. An independent transmedia story, um, and thus architecture in this case, is one that can be executed upon by a single person or a very small team. Um, let's say sub, you know, five or 10 people, small team, right? Uh, the primary things that we need to consider when we engage uh, in independent transmedia storytelling um, are the amount of artistic skill sets that are required by the transmedia stories architecture. Um, we have to do this because small teams or no team um, means that are, you don't have a lot of artistic disciplines available to you. So we must consider that. Uh, we should also consider the production constraints that are inherent to creating any piece of entertainment because we don't have the same time or money that larger studios have. Um, and we must create a narrative architecture with a broad array of mediums um, because a broad array of mediums attracts different audiences, adds some interactivity and dynamicity to the story, and it can also make our workload easier. So first, we must consider what artistic skill sets we have access to. 
Uh, whether we're working with a team or on our own, there's a limited number of artistic skill sets that uh, can be used, that we can use, right? Um, and each skill set means that we can um, only create in certain mediums. Uh, writers can, you know, write uh, scripts, poetry, and prose. Visual artists can make um, illustrations and storyboards. Musicians can write songs and create audio assets. And there are tons more, of course, um, but the question that you need to ask yourself as an independent creator is um, what artistic skill sets you or your team have access to and what you can make with that. The more variation you can include while considering that idea, um, the better. Um, mixing skills can also exponentially, exponentially increase the amount of mediums that we can work in, right? Um, for example, somebody who is a, both a writer and a visual artist can create all sorts of things by utilizing both skills, um, more than someone who is just a writer or just a visual artist. Um, but a writer and a visual artist working together um, can basically achieve the same thing, and that's why teams are so important to this type of work. Um, that being said, individuals that possess multiple skill sets might have a better chance at achieving a single authorial voice. Um, the more work done by a single mind, the better, better the possibility of the story being narratively tight. Um, now, obviously, this isn't always true, but it can be a factor to consider for some smaller, more individualistic artists. Uh, once we've determined what artistic skill sets we are able to utilize, we must next consider um, production constraints, um, which in this case are anything that can limit the production of a work in our architecture. Uh, creating art requires a lot of things. You need to be creative, dedicated, um, have skill in a given medium, possess an understanding of how people think and perceive the world, et cetera. And production constraints can vary too. Um, what may be difficult to film in a live action movie may be a piece of cake in animation. Um, but there are two vital constraints that are foundational to creating and releasing any art, time and money. Production time for any story can vary wildly, um, not only um, between mediums, but within them as well. It took Toby Fox, who made um, the popular video game Undertale, 34 months, um, but he also did all of the art, writing, programming, and music. Um, Stardew Valley, another popular indie game, um, was also developed by a single developer, Eric Barone, um, and took 48 months. Uh, film can take anywhere from a few weeks to a couple years, depending on the size of the film. It varies so much that it's hard to say. Um, and comics and novels um, and short stories can also vary a lot but they tend to have shorter creation times um, because relatively speaking, they require less artistic um, skill sets to uh, create. Um, so as independent storytellers, we don't have as much time as better supported artists. Three years of making art means that people aren't seeing your art and you're not getting paid for it, which is pretty important if your art is your primary source of income. Um, people's interest in a story also diminishes the longer they aren't exposed to it, which means your story will be seamless You'll make less money, impact less people, et cetera. So we're trying to cut down on how much it takes us to produce our art as much as we possibly can. So how do we get that time back? There are a few ways. Uh, we can plan around story elements. Most narrative-driven mediums um, have the same basic elements that must be planned. Um, some examples are characters, plot, environment, aesthetic, and um, items. Um, now, each of these can be broken down into subcategories, um, but these are some of the more fundamental basic um, concepts, right, that we work with. Each, uh, each um, artistic work in a transmedia architecture is likely to focus on certain elements over others, right? Um, you need to know uh, which mediums you're going to focus on and which mediums you're not going to focus on. Sorry, which elements you're going to focus on and which elements you're not going to focus on for each project that you make. Um, you should do less work for the ones that you don't want to focus on as much, but still complete work. Um, and you should do more work on the elements that you are going to focus on, right? Uh, we can also maximize what you get out of your work um, just on a like element by element by element basis. If you create a story with enough, a story element with enough detail, um, reusing that story element can save you time, right? Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe got a lot of mileage out of Iron Man, right? They had to create that character once and then they could reuse him and his themes, aesthetic, et cetera, consistently. It saves you time overall. Um, and audiences can grow attached to elements they see repeatedly too, obviously, right? Um, Friends, the TV show, got a lot of work, a lot of uh, use out of that uh, cafe central perk, right? Um, people grew attached to it. You see coffee mugs all the time with the little logo. Um, and relatively speaking, that was really cheap for them to make because they made it once, maybe redid this out a couple of times, um, but that's about it, right? And a lot of this isn't medium specific. 
um, you can reuse the concepts of an item, character, and location, uh, not just like the actor or the animation or the script. Um, that idea of extensibility I mentioned earlier is important here. Um, story element, elements that can exist across mediums can be reused more and to better effect, which saves you time on creating new story elements, right? Um, but be sure to use them in interesting ways. Uh, don't copy and paste your story. Um, use the work that you have done as a jumping off point to tell new and interesting stories, right? Um, the ideas I'm talking about here are not an excuse for bad storytelling. Uh, reuse story elements. Do not use reuse theme or plot. Rule one is don't suck. But what about money? Narrowing uh, down how much it costs to make any piece of art is extremely difficult and would likely be a huge generalization. Doing that with time is too. Um, but in general, the more artistic skill or time it takes to create a work of art, the more expensive it's going to be because um, the art is going to be more complex, right? Uh, comics are a relatively cheap art to make, for example. Um, films and video games are not. The independent part of independent narrative designer um, basically tells us how much money we have. None. Uh, studios can put millions of dollars into the art they create. Um, a single person or even a small team just can't compete. So we need to get creative. You should craft your architecture to only include mediums that you can afford. A serialized live action medium like a web series or TV show is probably too expensive for a small team to create, um, but a comic, which is also serialized, might not be. Um, you should write stories that don't cost a lot to produce. Um, drawing an extravagant cosmic rift environment takes a lot more time and money um, than a uh, field, but that's not an excuse for boring environments either. Um, it's a balance, right? Um, you should use free tools where you can. There are plenty of free open source tools um, for all sorts of artistic disciplines. Um, they may not be as powerful as stuff that you pay for, um, but generally they're good for beginners and um, you can at least uh, get quality work out of them um, if you push them far enough, right? Uh, now, if you do have money, uh, you should be putting it towards your primary stories, your tentpole stories, um, not your secondary media components. Uh, we'll get to what that means in a minute. So obviously, um, releasing and charging for your art is how you're going to make most of your money. Um, but there are other options for this too, right? Um, you should monetize what you can. Uh, Patreon is really good for this. It's arguably like a narrative designer's dream. Um, you should take advantage of those secondary media components that I mentioned earlier and that I will explain in a minute um, because people get excited for that sort of thing, right? Um, Kickstarter, is also, Kickstarter is always an option, um, though it's a major commitment and a lot of work. Um, and you should look for grants. Um, there are all kinds for all sorts of art. Um, search around for ones that might, you might qualify for. Uh, some last thoughts on saving time and money. Uh, keep your individual project scope limited and your thus your transmedia architecture, right? Keep the scope limited. Um, the beautiful thing about transmedia storytelling is that scope can arise out of the collective existence of in individual stories. Um, and also uh, the reduction of time and money is a balance. If you give a project more time, um, you can probably find ways to make money out of it. Um, and it's probably worth it, but sometimes it isn't. And you need to be able to tell um, when that's the case and when it's not. All right, so we've saved time and money. How does the breadth of mediums in an architecture help? Well, here's the thing. I lied. Here's some more theory. Tent poles are not a piece of a camping equipment for us. Um, they use, uh, they are the pieces of media that tell the primary story of your transmedia franchise. They're the films in the Star Wars series, right? Um, the primary story that we all pay attention to. Secondary media components are the smaller stories that you tell, perhaps as mini prequels or tales that occur concurrently uh, with your primary story. So the comics in the Star Wars universe, right? Um, as indie narrative designers, uh, your media components will probably be smaller in scale than larger budget franchises, right? Um, because these terms are relative. Uh, your tentpole story may exist in a comic. For Disney, it's a film, right? Uh, tentpole uh, art, you know, works uh, well to deliver your primary story and are often uh, what your audience is waiting for. Secondary media components, SMCs, uh, can fill the void of content though while they're waiting. Um, they're good at keeping an audience excited. Um, they're a good cool down exercise as an artist because they're so much smaller and um, you, they can be so much more focused um, thematically or character wise. Um, and they can also be a potential route of monetization if done correctly. Um, they can be as small as you want. Um, they can be even as simple as uh, in-character social media posts. That's relatively easy to produce and you can make a lot of them, um, but people like that sort of thing, right? 
Um, in a way, secondary media components can be their own form of marketing. Um, if they're easy, easy to share, people will share them, um, especially if they're funny or cute. So what does all of this mean? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, in review, um, you should plan what mediums you will include in your narrative architecture by choosing um, those mediums based on the artistic skill sets that you have. Um, you should save time by designing story elements that are, um, can be uh, enjoyable and also easy to reuse. You should know which story elements to focus on in each individual project. You should design stories that don't need a lot of money to be told without sacrificing quality. Um, you should monetize what you can within reason and look around for grants. Um, you should keep your story scale in check and you should vary your tent poles and secondary media components. That's my bibliography and I have a couple more things. <laughs> Some acknowledgements because I, um, I am standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, a lot of people helped me get here. So family, I wanna thank my mom, Dad, Sarah, Auntie, Kevin, Cyrus, Wyatt, Uncle Mikey, Rosie, Grammy, Grandpa, Patty, Luke, and Caroline. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, I wouldn't be here without you. I wouldn't be the person I am without you. Um, I love you guys. Thank you so much for that. Some friends, some friends in order of meeting because I didn't want you guys to get jealous. Um, thank you, Brennan, Nikhil, Hayden, Brendan, Lucas, Justin, Santiago. Taylor, Tino, Tori, and Emily. Um, you guys remind me that I don't need to be working constantly um, to get stuff done. Um, sometimes I just need to take a break from things and I really appreciate that. So thank you guys too. Mentors, um, thanks Jeff for everything. I wouldn't be doing this without you. You're the best, you know how much I like you, whatever. Um, thank you, Patty McCarthy for being there when I needed it. Uh, thank you, Joe Donnelly for making me a better writer. Thank you, Paul Chelberg, for making me a better thinker. And thank you, Andrea Wren, for keeping my head on straight. Thank you, guys.